So I'm just going to kick off um, very briefly. I'm Graham Earl, I'm the head of the, the College of Humanities here um, at SOAS, and I'm an archaeologist um, as well with a, a great interest in uh, imaging, um, uh, uh, cultural uh, property, and uh, also issues to do with uh, repatriation of various kinds and and uh, and, uh, and and yeah, many many, many of the issues that I, I hope I'm gonna, we're, we're going to be hearing about um, today. So I'm, I'm very excited to hear the, the talk. So I won't stop you hearing the talk for too much longer. What I, what I do want to do is welcome you to the, the Robert H N Ho um, Foundation uh, Family Foundation lecture. Um, this today, as we know, is a, one of the lectures in a, in a series, and I understand it's the fifth year in which the foundation has, has sponsored this, ra uh, this range of lectures, so for which we're very, very grateful. Um, it's also hosted by the, uh, the, the fabulous Centre of Buddhist Studies, of which we're extremely proud, and, and all of, or many of you are, are members. Um, um, I've been learning over the last year or so about each of the, each of the centres, and the Centre of Buddhist Studies, I think, perfectly um, demonstrates the kinds of things that we, we hold so dear at, at SOAS. The fact that it's so richly interdisciplinary, the fact that it's so grounded in a multiplicity of languages, the fact that it's so strong in terms of its research, and the fact that it's, it grows so much from and draws so much from the partnerships that, 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 that we each have um, and that members of the centre have uh, across the world. Um, and it manages to do and share fabulous research um, with the world, with a, a broad public as well as the, the specialist audiences. Um, so, so I'm extremely uh, grateful and, uh, and, and proud to be introducing this lecture tonight. Um, I will hand over to my colleague, uh, Professor Lucia Dolce, the chair of the centre. Thank you, Graham. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce the speaker of tonight's lecture, uh, Professor Sonia Lee, uh, who is Professor of Art History, East Asian and Languages and Cultures and Religion uh, at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles, uh, where she is also currently chair of the Department of East Asian Languages and Cultures. Uh, Professor Lee is a specialist uh, in religious art and architecture of China and Central Asia. And her research interests um, have included the material culture of the ancient Silk Road, art and ecology, uh, Asian art collection, and heritage conservation. And I'd like to say a few words about her published work. And I'll be uh, reading something if you don't mind. So her first book, uh, entitled The Surviving Nirvana, Death of the Buddha in Chinese Visual Culture, published by the uh, Hong Kong University Press in 2010, uh, focused on uh, what, what we can consider one of the uh, most important motifs in Buddhist art across Asia, which is that of the representation of the, uh, of the moment of the death of the Buddha. And Professor Lee in this book shows uh, how, despite the fact that uh, um, the same iconographic configuration over centuries was repeated, uh, it was also made anew each time by a particular community of patrons and makers, um, especially in medieval China. Uh, what I think is interesting is that this book discusses not only the images of the Buddha, but also the funerary practices uh, that uh, became connected to it and other devotional practices such as the cult of relics. Uh, also very important is the, uh, uh, the approach uh, that uses uh, epigraphic evidence, historical sources, and connects the iconographies to the social political uh, context. I think this approach has been continued in uh, the second book, more recent book uh, by Professor Lee, which I have here for you to have a look at, uh, Temples in the Cliffside Buddhist Art in Sichuan published by the University of Washington Press in 2021. Um, this is, the book explores these monumental uh, cliff-side carvings in southwest China. And uh, um, as Professor Lee herself says, it is conceived as an art historical response to the debate on climate change and uh, uh, makes a case for understanding the complex relationships between human society and nature through the creation and reception of cultural monuments. 
um, in the book, she also speaks about sustainability and what happens uh, to the um, to existing uh, uh, sites that are repaired, or restored, or transformed through the centuries. It is a very ambitious book. Uh, because both for this long uh, durée perspective, but also, again, uh, for the interdisciplinary scholarship that it displays. And in fact, it was uh, the winner of the 2023 Independent Publisher Book Award in the nonfiction religion category. So I understand that uh, uh, Professor Lee has started a new project that is a bit of a continuation of this that will look also, at, again, at, at Don Juan and the, and the Silk Road and the issues uh, uh, raised uh, um, in, in this book. So I'll leave the floor to her, but please uh, join me to welcome uh, Professor Lee to SOAS. Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you so much to Professor uh, Lucia Doce for this uh, generous introduction and also for inviting me to give this lecture today. Uh, it's such a great pleasure to see old friends and also make some new ones. And uh, I would also like to thank uh, Haruka Saito for uh, taking care of all the logistics for this uh, talk and also arranging some of my travels uh, to London. I'm very happy to have this opportunity to share um, the, uh, this new research with you today. Uh, this is sort of conceived as like a spin-off from the book, something that I couldn't quite fit into the book, so it's going to be uh, a standalone piece. And I look forward to uh, comments and any questions you have at the end uh, of the talk. So um, I would like to start with uh, some of these rather startling images. The uh, removal and at times violent destruction of public monuments have been uh, common occurrences in recent years in uh, both in the US and also in the UK. Um, in the US, for example, Confederate monuments such as the Robert E. Lee statue in Charlottesville, which you see on your left, were the center of protests and violent uh, riots over uh, police brutality and also the legacy of systemic racism in American society. After the deadly confrontation, which it's captured in this photograph in 2017, um, the uh, statue finally came down in uh, 2021 and was melted uh, down uh, just past year to make, make way for the creation of a more inclusive public art installation. Uh, perhaps better known to you, uh, many of you in the audience, is the statue of the slave trader Edward Colston, which many of you uh, know that was uh, defaced and thrown into the harbor in Bristol in 2020. And uh, subsequently, the statue was uh, taken out of the water and put into a uh, museum gallery for display. So... Um, so I just want to start with uh, these kind of very startling images to talk about uh, the other side of historical monuments fate in uh, today's society, namely the restoration. But the monuments I will be discussing today are not statues of public figures placed in front of government buildings or uh, in public parks. Rather, they are monumental religious icons carved off of mountain cliff faces far away from city centers. The creation of a colossal Buddha, like what you see on the screen, was a monumental undertaking, requiring not only a large labor force, but also a steady stream of donations uh, for its maintenance. Throughout history, local and regional government officials were eager to sponsor projects of this sort because they are interested in making use of religious devotion to advance both religious and non-religious agendas. The makers of colossal Buddhas believe in their effectiveness in articulating a certain vision of hierarchical power that the uh, sponsors would be able to uh, attain over the intended viewing audiences. Even though the two groups of examples uh, I have introduced so far came from very different historical and cultural contexts, they do share this in common, namely this belief in the power of images. And I would also like to add that the alluring power of monumental statues continue to be recognized by later generations of users, 
who make the effort to restore and reuse these images for their own purposes. So for statues that have survived for many centuries, as in this case, uh, over 800 years, there are other factors contributing to their remarkable longevity besides the effective power inherent in the genre of um, colossal statuary. The examples that I will be discussing today all share one thing in common, namely their embeddedness within nature. So at um, Urfo Monastery, uh, um, at the historic town of Laitan, a site which uh, I have, uh, I will discuss at great length later today, the colossal Buddha was made part of a landscape shaped by rivers nearby. So as you can see in this uh, uh, overview, the Buddha is located See, I guess uh, the pointer doesn't show on the screen. Anyway, so uh, it's you can see the uh, wooden frame structure, and the Buddha is located inside there. And if you look a bit further to uh, the upper right-hand corner, and I do have let's see, a view. Uh, there's a river, and that's the uh, the true river that you're looking at in the upper right-hand corner. Oh, here you go. Thank you. So um, that's what you're looking at. And so um, so this is a river flowing in front of uh, the, the Buddha statue. And this is a view taken from a boat uh, of the site. So as you can see, the river has played such an important role in providing the primary mode of transportation for the surrounding communities. And um, the location of this monastery certainly uh, makes a statement by being located at the mountaintop so that whenever people comes, uh, come through, they will be able to see it from uh, far. The statue site specificity is in fact uh, characteristic of many other colossal Buddhas in China where they were often created in response to certain qualities associated with a particular place in nature. In origin stories associated with many historic uh, uh, Buddha sites, we learned that adapts often took certain topographical features such as the shape of a mountain cliff face or certain uh, natural phenomena such as light or mist or ecological conditions such as the gathering of animals at a tree grove or as a sign of divinity. And hence the very reason for finding uh, the place as a religious center. But what these records, these origin stories won't tell you is that the statues would remain in the same setting for centuries to come. How exactly the monument evolved within a complex web of ecological connections is what I'm particularly interested in exploring. The, um, the statue's long lifespan across centuries provides us with a long-term historical perspective on the changes in the local environmental conditions that have bore direct impact on the monument's physical state. Its materiality um, has much to tell us about the changing mindset and behavior of human users who continue to create meanings out of the site. It is this part that I want to focus on here. So how do people live and behave in the natural surrounding with religious monuments set within it? This question um, is closely related to what's been frequently asked in environmental ethics. How should humans interact with the environment and non-humans? Um, so that's a very big question that uh, it's part of environmental ethics for uh, quite, quite, quite some time. And um, as many of you know, it is a branch of philosophy. Uh, environmental ethics extends the scope of moral considerability to the natural world. Driven by a sense of crisis uh, and the activist agenda, many writers in the field deem anthropocentrism to be at the roots of many problems we face today. To find solutions, it is thus important to rethink the human relationship with animals, plants, and the non-living environment. It's also important uh, to note that environmental ethics 
emerged in a time when scientists who study nature were not satisfied with doing research alone, but were also determined to put the knowledge they generated into practice. They took up conserving and protecting natural resources themselves while seeking to influence government policy and pushing for different kinds of socioeconomic models to realize their vision. In order to make their work more persuasive and accessible to many people, uh, some proponents of na nature conservancy had turned to the study of religion for inspiration. Um, and likewise, scholars in religion have also actively joined the debate as they too believe that in fact a great deal of uh, religion can contribute to addressing the current environmental crisis. One notable uh, trend resulting from this convergence is, a, is comparative religious ethics that explores ecological issues from the perspectives of diverse religious faith. In the inversion field of religious environmental ethics, the basic question now becomes, how should humans interact with the environment and non-humans based on religious conviction, values, or norms? Some would go further beyond scholarship to advocate the fundamental changes in our way of living and attitude toward nature and other uh, beings. You'll be wondering why an art historian like myself talking about environmental ethics. So uh, let me now return to my earlier question. How do people live and behave in the natural surrounding with religious monuments set within it? So I'm basically adding uh, cultural monuments into the, uh, the debate. So instead of animals or plants, my focus will mainly be on man-made objects created to exist within a sp specific ecosystem. I'm particularly interested in the values that have uh, been ascribed to these statues, many of which were initially created to give material form to divine presence, perceive in nature, and would continue to be understood as such by many later users. Understanding the values of religious users and those who were brought into the discussion by non-religious users is crucial for adding cultural monuments to religious environmental ethics. One point of intersection lies in the place of value. This is the second point here. Because um, the place of value is central to the dialogue between science and religion in addressing the environmental crisis. So if you look into the writings of prominent thinkers, such as Holmes Rolston, who, have, who has long advocated for treating nature with reverence, a position that is meant to fill a gap in environmental science where deeper evaluative questions, such as the existence of goodness in nature, are still left open. While art historians are entering uh, into this discussion through the inclusion of cultural monuments into the ecosystem, I believe we do have a viable role to play precisely because issues surrounding values are also at the heart of modern heritage conservation. So I'm bringing many different views together through this question about values. The engagement of art historians with heritage conservation and environmental ethics underscores a reconceptualization of art historical research as a form of historical inquiry and at the same time, a direct pragmatic intervention into policies and practices related to those religious monuments that I study. In heritage conservation, scholars are stakeholders who do interact with other stakeholder groups, such as the site managers, government officials, visitors, restorers, in an ongoing dialogue on what gets preserved and how to do it. Maintaining this dual focus on scholarship and its applicability in the real world is central to a larger aim in my recent book, namely, it is of great importance to bring cultural monuments into the climate debate and sustainability discourse to explain how cultural conservation or preservation ought to be part of the solution moving forward. Art historians can do a lot to advance this goal by demonstrating that enduring cultural monuments like uh, the Colossal Buddhas, in fact, offer us invaluable lessons on how to forge a sustainable future. 
Like the emergence of nature conservancy movement more than half a century ago, it is time for art history or people in art history to join in today's climate action and discussion with our unique scholarly contribution. I will spell in more concrete terms what religious environmental efforts through heritage conservation entails after discussing um, the site that I would like to focus on, uh, namely the Earthworm Monastery of Lytan, where I have done uh, extensive field work until the outbreak of the global pandemic in 2020. The case at hand is representative of the state of heritage conservation in post-socialist China, especially at sites that are less well-known and somewhat off the beaten track. And I find it particularly productive to study these sites, sort of the second tier site, because they highlight the tension between central authority, regional and local interests uh, more, uh, um, uh, more clearly. As you, can, uh, you might expect, sites that have received support from the highest level of government tend to align more closely with the official position and hence less interesting. Uh, this is certainly the case at uh, a site called Baodingshan, which I have also uh, studied at great length. And in fact, that's uh, the, a, uh, the subject of uh, some of the chapters in my book. So um, before I go further, I just want to uh, make sure that uh, everybody in the audience understand what I mean by post-socialist post uh, period in China. Um, it basically refers to the time from the uh, open market reform in 1976 onward, um, which uh, 1976, as many of you know, uh, was marked by Mao Zedong's death and the opening of China to the world, and the beginning of economic reform that ensued. So um, as China emerged as a major economic power on the world stage beginning in the 1990s, one important development to have taken place domestically was the tremendous attention paid to historical monuments around the country. The central government took the lead by investing significantly in the maintenance and cares of thousands of historic, uh, historical and uh, heritage properties that were designated as such since the 1950s, but did very little to protect or maintain uh, because the lack of funds. But with the economic uh, boom of the 1990s onward, um, it's, it's it started to change in this time period. And uh, so it's not just uh, being done out of nationalistic pride, uh, as much as uh, pretty shrewd economic calculations. So some of you might know that by early 20, uh, 2000s, early 20, uh, 21st century, some of the manufacturing industries and infrastructure development uh, began to cool down. Domestic tourism was seen as a alternative to keep up with the red hot economy that yielded double digit uh, GDP growth uh, year after year after year after year. Within this context, it is uh, interesting to see that colossal Buddha statues continues to remain a source of fascination in this period. So um, on the screen, I'm showing you some of the brand new statues that were created across the country uh, in the early 21st century. So uh, to your far left is actually part of a theme park uh, at Lushan. I think Stefania might be interested in this site. Uh, so you have a, uh, a attempted replication of the Bamian Buddha uh, at the site that measures over 33 meters tall, and you can tell the the scale just by looking at the uh, the visitors at the near the feet of the Buddha, and on your uh, on your right is a site called Lingyunshan uh, at the city of Nanchong in the eastern part of uh, Sichuan, where there actually been some very interesting new uh, uh, monumental statues being created. So in this case, it's a reclined Buddha. Given my interest in the theme of uh, the Buddha's Nirvana, uh, so this. Buddha measures, I believe, over um, 76 meter long, so it's very, very long. And there are also many other groups of statues. And uh, I have a really very unusual experience there meeting the, um, the, the company that's in charge of uh, building the site. And also the uh, artisans, uh, they hire from Datu to build it. So, uh, but it didn't end up in my book in part because 
There's also the religious dimension that I'd be happy to talk more about uh, later. So these are brand new statues. Now what about the old ones? Well, they receive uh, special treatment through very expensive uh, restorations. So uh, the one on your far left is the Thousand of Avalokitesvara at Baolingshan in Daju. That's uh, the World Heritage Site uh, uh, in, in that area. And the entire area that you see shining in bright colors uh, were completed in uh, 2015. So it took them seven, eight years to undertake this uh, restoration. Before they did that, uh, I believe it was done purposely uh, to starve up the Tongnan Great Buddha, which was finished in 2012. Uh, so they completed it just to test out the technology and uh, uh, some of the uh, steps in the restoration before they undertake the more famous site. And so um, you can see there's a trio of examples. The uh, Earthful Monastery Buddha uh, is the last of the three. And in case you're wondering how big they are, uh, the Thousand of Avalokitesvara is about eight meter tall. So um, not as big as the other ones, but it's still pretty uh, monumental. Whereas the, uh, the Tongan Great Buddha is close to 19 meter high. So uh, if you stand next to it, you are probably up just a little bit above the feet. Restoring a monumental statue like the, these two examples is an enormously complex operation. Not only does it come with high operation, uh, operational costs that measure in tens of millions of yuan, the process of restoration is also time consuming, often involving multiple rounds of negotiation among disparate groups of stakeholders uh, with different worldviews and agendas. So you have government officials, experts in heritage conservation and other related fields, site managers. So all of these groups will be involved or are involved in uh, deciding on what appearance the Buddha would take at the end, what kind of materials and techniques to be used for the restoration job, and how to uphold its imputed values throughout the process. So this last part is the most important because the success of a project is often measured by the values set at the outset. Um, and these values, according to heritage, conser uh, heritage conservation laws today, is based on the historical, scientific, and artistic values. So for visitors, uh, especially those coming from nearby communities, such uh, restorations can be a nuisance. Since many of them come to the site to worship the Buddha for devotional pur uh, purposes, a restoration may prevent them from seeing or worshiping the icon for months, if not years. One positive outcome to make up for all the inconvenience for local residents is a renewal of the statue's perceived efficacy in inspiring religious devotion and civic pride. In short, a major restoration helps bring many stakeholders together with challenging, while challenging them to think about what values the site may hold for them uh, today. As they engage in class with each other, the occasion also affords researchers like myself from the outside a unique opportunity to see in real time how the process unfolded under circumstances uh, specific to the time and place. So I first learned about the plan to restore the Colossal Buddha at Urfo Monastery in the summer of 2017, when I was doing work in Daju, uh, carrying out uh, interviews of uh, conservation professionals involved in the uh, earlier restoration at Baolingshan. The Southwest region, uh, some of you in the audience might know, has one of the highest concentrations of Buddhist monuments in the entire China. So let me turn to uh, some maps to show you where it is located. So uh, the, north, the southwest region entails both the province of Chung, uh, Sichuan and also the special administrative region of Chongqing. So that's uh, the southwest region. And for some of my colleagues, they also do work in Guizhou and Yunnan. So that's also the greater southwest part of China. And then you zoom in, so you can see that Daju is located along the eastern part of Chongqing. And uh, the site that I am talking a great deal about, um, uh, Urfo Monastery in Enlaitan, is just located outside the city of Hetuan, where you see 
the, uh, the confluence of uh, several major rivers, including the Yangtze River, the Chu River, and the Jiaoling River, all converge uh, at this location here. And just to show you even um, in greater detail, so Hutuan City is where all these rivers come together, and Laitan is located just a little bit off along the Chu River. So if you're visiting the town today, um, let me go. so I have this map showing you uh, roughly the topography and also where things are located. So Laitan is now a so-called historical town, even though I don't think there's a lot of history associated with it, but it's such a common uh, development these days that all of a sudden so many historical towns popping up, even though they don't really have a very long history. And so this is what's debarkated by the red. And the, uh, the protected area is uh, debarkated by the magenta color here. So that's where the Great Buddha is located, plus some of the carvings uh, covered by the, uh, the wooden frame structure. So in case you're wondering about the, the area to, the, to one side, and that's known as the upper hall of Urvo Monastery, and currently there is a active Buddhist temple uh, located right there. And the monks who live there, uh, I believe, are all from the Urmishan area. And they pr practice a very unusual kind of uh, esoteric Buddhism there. I'll be happy to elaborate a little more if any of you are interested in it. So I'll be focusing primarily on this area uh, where the restoration takes place. And it's also known in historical sources and also in the local uh, um, sources as the lower hall, as opposed to the upper hall of Urban Monastery. So the Buddha statue, maybe I'll show you a couple more pictures. So that's what's inside, and then the Buddha is standing right here. And then if you climb up the stairs to the second or third uh, levels, you see so many carvings. And, um, and many of these carvings are, are, are of uh, Chang theme, so belonging to Chang Buddhism. And so this is actually a quite unusual feature of our Urban Monastery because uh, of this connection to Chang Buddhism. So, um, so many scholars believe that there might have been a pretty uh, large uh, Chang Monastery site uh, in, in the area for many uh, centuries. The Buddha statue, use this example, this uh, slide, uh, is the best, uh, one of the best known uh, cultural monuments in this area. And the name uh, Urfo, or the second Buddha, it has to do with uh, the fame that it had, or it has had uh, in the region. So uh, the number one Buddha, or the number two Buddha, so it's called the number two Buddha, uh, in part because I think the number one Buddha is the Tongan Buddha that was really famous up to fairly recent times. And if you ask uh, um, uh, tourist uh, agents, uh, tourism agents today, they probably didn't know that the Tonghan Buddha is actually more famous in the past. Uh, and so, uh, so that uh, has something to do with the uh, naming. And the site um, is, uh, has been around uh, as early as the, the Tang Dynasty. So there was a inscription from the, uh, the 15th, 16th century, we're referring back centuries ago to the Tang Dynasty when one of the emperors uh, visited the site. So that's an indicator that uh, the site was already in operation by the time the emperor visited in the 9th century. So the Buddha itself probably was created uh, later, so probably in the 12th century, so a couple hundred years after its initial founding. And the entire Buddha is about 15 meter tall and carved out of the north cliff face of the, uh, the site. So it's facing south. And there are about 1,700 other carvings all along. So it's a pretty elaborate uh, setup. And also, in, uh, I would also like to point out that, I go back to the overview, that there are actually quite a number of 
tombs for uh, monks scattered throughout this entire place. So that's an indicator that there was a very big uh, monastic community for existed for a very long time. So given its popularity in the region, the urban monastery has naturally come under the watchful eye of the state and local authorities. Following the founding of the People's Republic of China, it was among the first batch of historical sites uh, in Sichuan to be designated top priority protected heritage properties at the provincial level. So that was uh, given the designation in 1956. But not a whole lot has been done to the site uh, until about 2006, so almost 50 years later. And uh, it was actually uh, given a slightly higher um, uh, category. So it was named one of the country's important protected cultural heritage units. So once we get this kind of destination, uh, there will be special fundings made available for the site for its maintenance. And the new destination also prompted local officials in Hertuan to take action in order to take advantage of the site's growing renown within the uh, official circle. In 2011, five years after the destination, the Hertuan City Investment Company, a state-run business, funded, by, uh, funded a major repair of the wooden shelter, the one that you, uh, I've been showing you uh, outside the, 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 um, the uh, cliff carvings. Long, uh, not long uh, after uh, the shelter repair project was completed in 2013, the uh, Hertuan Development Investment, a uh, slightly different uh, company, uh, also plan started to uh, plan for yet another major repair project, and this time involving the Colossal Buddha. The uh, singular interest in restoring the statue can be seen as a bandwagon response to a similar project at Baolingshan, the one that I've been showing you here, uh, which, uh, was, um, <clears throat> which received the uh, China's top priority conservation project. So that's like the number one project. And that also came with uh, enormous amount of funding to the tune of um, 60 million yuan. So it's roughly about 6.6 uh, 6, uh, million pounds. I hope I did the calculation right. There's a lot of money to restore just this part. So as you can see in the comparison, one of the most striking aspects of the restoration in Datu is the brilliant color of all the new material added to the ancient statue. And uh, let me show you this comparison, uh, the before and after. And uh, um, you can see the bright color really stands out. The, uh, and also the brand new appearance forms a uh, pretty uh, startling contrast to the, uh, the statue's older look that you see on the right. And uh, for many uh, visitors, the, uh, the, the photograph on your, uh, on your left doesn't quite fit the expectation that we have for a 900-year-old religion, religious icon. It took the conservators, uh, also restore us three years of research, debate, and experimentation to come to this decision. So um, let me explain it very, uh, in very simple terms. Because uh, there's a very big problem at this particular location at uh, Baolingshan, where the, um, there's constant water seeping out from the cliff. So over time, the, uh, the crystallization of uh, salt in the water caused delamination of uh, the, the outer surfaces of the statue. So you can see on the right hand side, that's where the delamination took place. And this is the contrast to uh, the work that they are doing. So originally, they were planning to um, collect all the existing gold leaves and put them back together. But then um, in the course of planning the operation, they realized that um, there, there wasn't enough gold leaves to go around. So basically, they really had to use some new material. And um, so they started to um, put them back. And before they do that, they uh, put consolidant into the stone to make sure that all the cracks have been fixed. And, uh, and also, uh, a very important part of the process is actually use the, uh, 
the traditional method of lacquer gilding, lacquer-based gilding to put the gold leaves on. Uh, initially, they were planning to use some uh, super glue imported from Italy, but that didn't quite work uh, in the very humid climate of uh, Southwest China. So even though it's supposed to be one of the best conservation material, but because of the, uh, uh, the, the very unique uh, climate uh, conditions, uh, that didn't quite work. And so, uh, so that's related to this concept called eco-compatibility that I talk uh, much, at much greater length in, uh, in my book project. So this is a way to show you the, the kind of technical difficulties that one might encounter in a project like this. So um, going back to uh, uh, Laitan at the Urban Monastery, in 2018, the central government finally gave the Hutuan City Investment the official permission to initiate the restoration of the Laitan Buddha. Unlike any of the previous repairs of the site, they invited the country's top conservation researchers and professionals to carry out the project, notably Peking University, uh, I should say the Department of Archaeology for the Archaeological Survey, and also a company called the Beijing Cultural Heritage and Traditional Architecture Engineering Company for both the consolidation and restoration. So uh, first time hiring uh, outside experts to carry out the job. When I got the news that the restorers had just erected a massive scaffolding around the Buddha, as you see in my slide on, uh, on the right, I went to her trying as soon as I could in order to interview some of the people involved. I also had the opportunity to see the statue up close. Whenever people are building a scaffolding along these Buddha, uh, Buddhas, you just have to go because that's the only chance you can climb all the way up to look at it. So through this, I came to understand the gilding process uh, as well as why the deterioration occur at uh, the site. So besides the soap problem I mentioned earlier, um, one contributing factor to the, the gilded surfaces uh, was the way uh, that the previous restorations uh, were done. So when you climb all the way up to see the face, and I think this area is particularly revealing. So based on a lot of the exper uh, experiments conducted by the res restorers at Daju, uh, it's believed that the best way to do restoration is if you don't clean out the initial surface, you just put another layer uh, of uh, plaster and then lacquer it before you put the gold leaves on. But if you look at uh, what has been done at Lycan, you see that they simply just put the gold leaves on top of the previous layer without doing all the proper work. And this actually raises a lot of very interesting questions about how to dispose uh, sacred material or materials related to a sacred icon like this. It's not so easy just to dump the old material in a garbage can. And so you really have to think of ways to desacralize the icon and also uh, to dispose this material properly. Or another way out is just not to deal with it, just put another layer on. So you don't have to deal with waste or sacred waste. And so this is something that I learned while looking at this Buddha very closely. So restorers in the past uh, understood that covering the stone statue with just mineral paint will have eroded away more quickly than with lacquer surfaces. So um, the combination of lacquer with gold leaves was the solution they came up with, which is a perfect example what I call eco-compatibility in art making. The material and technique satisfied a technical challenge posed by the local climate conditions while providing a aesthetic uh, aesthetics commensurate with the devotee's expectations. So what I mean by this is that um, in many descriptions of the Buddha's appearances in texts, in scriptures, uh, oftentimes the Buddha is described to have this golden appearance uh, as a way to reflect the thousands of rays of light shooting out from his body. And so the goal actually serves multiple uh, purposes, that it's actually a, a perfect fit in this sense. And when you have multiple layers of these gilded surfaces that accrue on the statue's exterior, many uh, rounds of restoration over time, uh, what you have is really a history of the site and is continual relevance within the local community. So am I arguing that the stratigraphy of the 
the statue services, it's really the kind of material evidence that I have to really retrace the history of the site. And, um, and also a lot of the um, thinking about uh, the, 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 the Buddha and also the values ascribed to the Buddha all packed into this very unique form of material evidence. And uh, so this is uh, one of the uh, reasons why the restorers at the Irvine Monastery decided to make it a top priority to determine the most suitable approach to preserve and reattach some of these existing gold leaves while applying new layers to expose services to protect the stone. So they learned from the lessons of the two previous restorations. So, uh, so, so let's see what they, what they did. In 2019, a year later, I went back to Lytan to check on the progress made on the restoration. Now the this, this scaffolding that I showed you earlier was still there, uh, but there was also something new that caught my eye. Um, so this is um, the, a sample that's uh, from the Urfo Monastery um, uh, statue, where you see the four layers of uh, um, restoration done. And so, uh, so this is uh, the stratigraphy that I was talking about to show you the, uh, the layers that at the very core will be the stone of the mountain cliff. And then there's a ground where the first layer of lacquer was applied. Now in 2019, uh, after uh, the first trip, I went back and saw this. So uh, the restorers came up with four different possibilities for how to restore uh, the Buddha. And they put it out for uh, feedback from the community. So it's a very unusual move. So um, as you can see, you can just consolidate the stone and leave everything unpainted, just plain. And then the second and third is uh, kind of similar in the sense that, okay, so we're gonna collect some of these old leaves and put them back alongside new material. Uh, but it's the, uh, the extent of uh, applying or adding the new material varies between these two. And then the last possibility is that you just make, you just make everything new. So including painting the hair blue and then everything new. So, uh, so that's uh, a very interesting uh, display that they put out at the site where um, local residents continue to come and uh, look at them. And they also started to uh, um, collect feedback from these people. What I find to be remarkable about this display is the initiative taken by the restorers to involve the local community through education and information sharing uh, about the restoration process, something that's, that was missing in the previous uh, restorations. So this was a step clearly uh, uh, missing from the one. And, uh, and it also underscores the top-down uh, expert-driven approach that was characteristic of uh, uh, heritage uh, conservation principles at top tier sites in China. So um, uh, the restorers, because they're working at a uh, second tier site, uh, consider it to be uh, important to uphold the religious and social values that the site exemplify in its long history for being part of the surrounding community. So from the technical standpoint, this also means the need to develop approach to the Buddha's appearance, which mainly defined by the scolded services, that can fully capture its role as a historical monument, as well as an object of devotion for many of its visitors. The restorers in Lightan were aware of the many criticism of the previous uh, restoration at Baolingshan at Tungnan, um, where uh, it was uh, criticized by a lot of people for being not uh, uh, compatible with expectations of age old uh, monuments. So, uh, because of this awareness of the past failures, the, uh, the, uh, the technicians here uh, have uh, decided to take a more cautious approach by asking for feedback uh, at the outset in order to avoid confusion and also controversy. Okay, so in 2020, uh, April 2020, just after the outbreak of the global pandemic where nobody could travel anymore, uh, I got uh, a text from uh, uh, the site manager at the site where he sent me uh, the uh, photographs of the newly restored Buddha at River Monastery. And so I 
uh, want to share with you the photos that I receive in in uh, in uh, in the text. And if you look more closely, you see that they opted for uh, the approach sort of in the middle, namely that you see the the clothes of the Buddha. It's very smooth and very brand new looking, but the body has this more uh, texture uh, look and somewhat age look as a way to reflect uh, the older history that it entails. And I'd be very curious to hear from, your, uh, from the audience if they've done a successful job or maybe <laughs> they still need to uh, aim for more improvement. So, uh, so that's uh, one set of photographs. And so this is a way for you to see what it looked like before and uh, the statue that's now. So you can see that uh, the gold leaves are peeling off, so they decided to do something about it, and this is the result. And it's also interesting to note that uh, for the hair and part of the lips, these are just paint, these are not gilded. And this is a picture taken um, last year uh, when one of my graduate students went uh, and she took a picture, and already you see that the bright, shiny gold color uh, was tarnished a little bit just a, one year or two afterward because it's sitting in a very humid area. Um, so it's started to age along with uh, the, the rest of the Buddha. All right, so now you've seen quite a lot of the restoration at uh, Urban Monastery. So let me now uh, come to a conclusion, the concluding part of my paper. So to wrap up, so let me turn uh, back to uh, the title of my talk, let's skip that. So what lesson in sustainable heritage and na uh, nature conservation do we learn from restoring colossal Buddhas like this one at Urban Monastery? As introduced earlier, the restoration of these icons is ideal for developing what I call religio environmental ethics through heritage conservation. So there are three key points that I like to derive from uh, this particular example. So first of all, let me use this something to look at. Well, first of all, uh, the, the case we have at uh, Irvine Monastery exemplifies a major problem in heritage conservation, namely the conceptualization of historic sites as cultural and economic resources, and which has led to a difficulty in balancing fundamental goals in preservation, economic interests, and community needs. In post-socialist China, the dynamics between different stakeholder groups has also been shaped by a top-down expert center approach. Because the site uh, that we're looking at uh, doesn't belong to the top tier uh, of uh, heritage uh, properties, uh, so that's not central, not as central to the central government's nationalistic agenda. You see more tension existed between the government official business interests and local residences from nearby communities. What I want to stress here is a sustainability perspective whereby there is a attempt at achieving a greater balance between conservation objectives and the role of the local community. Like the restorers at Lytan, I think it's of vital importance to involve the local residents. It is only so much the government can do as the official custodian of the past, and it is really up to the local community to do the heavy lifting to preserve past traditions and heritage. If they keep being displaced and disenfranchised, as in many other uh, heritage sites, the long-term goal of preservation would be seriously undermined. So this problem is not limited to China alone, but in fact, at a lot of uh, countries where there's a very rich heritage uh, um, uh, list of heritage sites. So in uh, 2015, the uh, UNESCO adopted a new policy to integrate a sustainable development perspective into the processes of World Heritage Convention. So this marks a milestone in the effort to protect biological and cultural diversity while addressing issues of equity and social justice through inclusive social and economic development. Time will tell how far reaching the impact of this new policy is on heritage sites around the world. For the present at least, sustainability is a useful concept with which to understand the situation at Urvo Monastery, where the ongoing restoration of the colossal Buddha has brought to light many potential challenges and opportunities ahead. 
In a more sustainable mode of engagement between conservation professionals and local community, education, dialogue, and empathy are three key principles. A sustainability perspective can help bridge this gap by fostering mutual understanding between different stakeholder groups through learning and listening to each other's values and real points. This means that the site managers will find ways to acknowledge the site's past history as a local religious institution and accommodate inside religious uh, uh, activities to the extent allowed by the state regulations and professional conservation guidelines. Visitors, in turn, will be introduced to the basics of cultural heritage and learn to respect the importance of conservation and the site's current status as a heritage property. As you have already seen, information sharing about the restoration process and the objective was an encouraging first step. But I think the site managers at Lightan, uh, at Urban Monastery can do more. And um, so I would like to turn to a nearby example. And that's the Tongan Buddha, because I think they actually went a lot further in actually introducing the site to visitors. So besides seeing uh, uh, the restored Buddha inside the main temple, if you walk around the site, there are actually a lot of very informative maps and uh, historical markings where you see that the Buddha actually once existed not only as a religious icon, but in fact as a flood control agent. That there were like rounds of flooding in this whole area, and they actually preserved some of the markings done in the 17th century, 18th century. And so these markings became part of the landscape of uh, the, the around the Buddha. So I think that um, at Urfo Monastery, they could certainly do more uh, to this effect. Now, the second point I would like to make is in this material-based form of religious and environmental ethics, we need to expand the current definition of what the environment and the non-humans mean to incorporate different worldviews and networks of traditional knowledge. So in our case, colossal Buddhas have long been part of the surrounding landscape for centuries. They were regarded as alive with the numinous quality and the perceived power in bringing changes to the devotee's life. From inscriptional records that have survived at River Monastery, for example, we learned that people regarded the Buddha as the integral part of the landscape for a very long time. The Chu River brought visitors to the site, as well as donations and materials needed for the temple's revival and maintenance. In later centuries, many came to ask the Buddha for help after flooding. The concept of sympathetic resonance was the way Buddhist monastics would explain the relationship between the Buddha and his human followers, whereby Buddhist divinities would respond in kind through certain happenings in nature, while human devotees show devotion with sincerity or act to uphold uh, the Buddha's teaching. The purported animism in nature, according to the Buddhist, certainly reminds us of the attempts made by many ecologically minded thinkers of our time to re enliven nature with ideas such as vibrant materialism, as in Jane Bennett's work, many of which came about to uh, look deep into the roots of the current environmental crisis while charting new ways forward. And many of these thinkers were actually responding to what's been called the death of nature with the rise of the scientific revolution in the 17th century onward, where nature is actually being seen as just mere matter, that it's kind of dead. So that kind of animistic quality was being killed by mechanistic sciences like the things that you find in Newton and other uh, scientists of the time. So what's really interesting about uh, our case is that the local community has always believed in the vibrancy of the landscape around the lifetime Buddha. They were where such knowledge from the past has been preserved. The Buddha, in short, is the material manifestation of the deep connections to the land that the local community has long sought to maintain through their worship of the icon. So I'm just arguing that the Buddha needs to be part of the discussion if we are talking about both uh, heritage and nature con conservation. The restoration of Buddhist monuments also call attention to the place of religious values in heritage conservation in China. The uh, restorers in Daju and Laitan have actually proactively uh, justify the efforts by underscoring religious values at the respective site. So in the official documents, they actually added religious values to the purpose of the whole project 
something that's actually quite remarkable because in the cultural heritage laws, only three values that's actually being considered to be important, the historical, scientific, and artistic values. So his religious values have always been left out. And so now slowly through this project, it's actually being brought back to the discussion. So the conspicuous exclusion of the religious values from the legal framework was partly the result of broader attempt by the modern Chinese nation state at nationalizing religion for control purposes. It's a pretty well-known narrative in modern Buddhist studies where uh, it's all about uh, state control of religion. And so religious values should not be part of the discussion. Although the central government will not alter this uh, current cultural heritage law in the foreseeable future, and certainly I don't see that uh, moving at all, there are telltale signs of change prompted by these emergent discourse on intangible cultural heritage. A number of unofficial religious organizations have actually taken advantage of that to stay afloat. The movement has also had some impact on the practice of tangible heritage. So in the 2015 revision of the principles for the conservation of heritage sites in China, uh, a set of principles that, uh, that was being developed by the Getty Conservation Institute and the Chinese government, uh, they actually added something, not quite religious value, but something called diversity uh, or cultural value that's being something that needs to be conserved. And then diversity is part of this cultural value. So the language actually allows room for interpretation if those involved in the site's conservation choose to do so. So in environmental ethics, the fundamental goal is to ensure the long-term human survival on this planet by not taking nature for granted. To this end, many proponents, such as uh, Holmes Wellstand, uh, something, uh, someone I've been reading very closely, has advocated for care and reverence of nature by bringing religion into dialogue with env environmental science. I believe that art historian, too, can play an important role in this broader discussion through uh, the inclusion of religious values that cultural monuments, such as the Colossal Buddha, that Lycan exemplifies. Conserving the Buddha in situ means accepting the challenges inherent in the natural landscape, uh, of which it has been a part for a very long time. It also acknowledges the need to work with the local community in so doing, the expert and heritage profession, professionals do not assume a dominant role. So it's a, a, a change in the hierarchy that I'm also talking about. So this would hopefully parallel the ideal relationship between nature and, uh, uh, and humans that's been advocated in the field of environmental ethics. And one final point uh, and takeaway uh, from this project uh, concerns my role as a researcher. And I've done it quite purposely in this talk to insert myself in the narrative because I want to show that scholars like myself are also stakeholders in the heritage conservation. And so in this studies, I participated in a lot of ongoing dialogues with other stakeholders. So I'm kind of serving as a role as a facilitator in, in that sense and, um, and pushing for certain viewpoints and courses of action. So I explained to my colleagues the value of community outreach and information sharing and I certainly encourage them to do that. Uh, and, and seeing that myself as a foreign expert, so it has a category like that. Uh, so I am also mindful of what I can or what I cannot do. And sometimes they need foreign experts like me to tell their boss something that they couldn't really tell them. And so I certainly serve a role in that sense. So, uh, but at the same time, after so many years away from the site, due to uh, uh, the global pandemic and also travel restrictions and also de deteriorating uh, relationships between the US uh, and, and China, I will have to figure out if some of the conclusions uh, or the findings I reached before the pandemic can still hold today. So uh, the story will continue. And so um, I will just end my talk here and I'd be very happy to uh, answer any questions and uh, hear your feedback on the project. Thank you so much.